Hello, and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and in this episode, I'm joined by Sachin Kajuria. Sachin is the founder and chief investment officer at Achilles Management, a private investment business that uses artificial intelligence technology. He's also the author of Two and Twenty, a book about private equity and other private markets, which was published earlier this month by Penguin Random House. Prior to founding Achilles, Sachin spent eight years at Apollo Global Management, where as a partner of the firm, he led investments for their flagship global funds in private equity, distressed debt, and special situations. He remains a limited partner of Apollo funds, as well as those of Blackstone, Carlisle, and Goldman Sachs. But it's mostly Sachin's 25 years of experience financing, analyzing, and managing large-scale complex investments at Apollo and elsewhere that we're going to talk about today as we hear his insider's view of private equity. Welcome, Sachin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. As I mentioned, uh, your book, Two and Twenty, hit bookstores this month. What is the focus of the book, and what do you hope readers will take away from it? The main focus of the book is increased awareness about private equity and other private markets. And second, what I think are the winning drivers behind private equity, what it takes to win, and how the best players in the industry stay at the top. So if we start on the first one, I think that there's an understanding most people need to have that private equity is now mainstream. It's not an esoteric corner of Wall Street. It's not something that you don't really need to think about because your job is not in private equity or you don't meet people who work in private equity. Private equity is as important to you as public markets are. And that's a very important point that I think a lot of people don't really understand. So it's not just Wall Street, it's Main Street, it's everywhere. In terms of scale, the wealth controlled by the major private equity firms today is in excess of $12 trillion across private market strategies. So that's more than the GDP of many nations. And so you know the big tech household names, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, etc. And you need to know more about the big names in private equity, because even if you're just a customer of companies or businesses that offer private equity backed products or services, you're still part of that industry, you're a customer to that industry. And more important than that, I think, private equity is invested across the economy, from chemicals to energy to financial services, in niches, from kindergartens to dating apps, from cybersecurity to college textbooks. It's basically everywhere. And the same way that you think that a lot of the companies that you deal with are public companies, you should now realize that a lot of the companies, a lot of the products and services that you're involved with or you're a customer of or you supply to are backed by private capital. And the reason this is important is because when we think about your retirement plans and your own long-term financial planning, it's not just stocks and bonds which are going to be on your investment menu. We're at a tipping point in the industry now where in addition to the major institutions that have historically invested in private equity, pension funds, retirement systems, sovereign wealth funds backed by foreign governments and so on, retail is entering the investor pyramid. So starting with the mass affluent and moving eventually to individual investors. So that means IRAs, 401k plans or different structures. And so it's going to be available to you soon if it isn't already available to the folks who run your pension plan. And it may be available to you at some point where you actually have to take the decision yourself. And that's why you need to realize that it's mainstream. And that's why the book is designed to help you identify what I think are the winning traits, principles behind the firms who stay at the top of that industry. So you can make an informed choice for your own financial future. Great. Well, it, during in the book itself, you, you go through several, I'll call it slightly altered stories of past wins in private equity that were, were based on real deals. It's really it makes for quite a compelling read uh, where in, in, in the book, you, you, what you call masters of private equity, 
identify a, a complex problem and work their way through that complexity, see through the short-term noise that the market is throwing up. And, and I'm thinking such in here about the general insurance example that you use. And then take a measured risk with an outsized payoff profile. What I'm interested in hearing about, though, is where PE can go wrong. What mistakes can happen? And are there any that investors in public markets might be able to learn from? Sure. So I think in many of the examples in the book, you see that the deals may have needed to pivot because they're long-term deals. Remember, these are unlisted. And so uh, they may have gone right in the end, hopefully so, in all the cases I've been involved with so. But along the way, they may have had pivots. Now, you're talking about situations where they've just gone wrong completely. And so what can happen there is, you know, it's kind of similar to any business decision where there could be a miscalculation of the thesis. It's The thesis is just wrong. We thought that this, this, and this could or should happen to this business or enterprise, and we'd end up with a company with these characteristics, and we just didn't. It didn't work. And no matter what we changed, no matter uh, the fact that we were outside the public arena, we were not in inhospitable public markets like we see today. It just didn't work. And what that basically means to me is that it's very, very likely that it would have failed anyway, and it probably would have failed quicker. So let's look at an example. So if you have a high street business, a main street business, a retail business, bricks and mortar, and it's not prepared for an online transition, we've seen that movie before. Sooner or later, the products come online and the business doesn't need to exist. So what could you do? You could develop an online presence for it. You could try to engage with your customers more actively. You can try to develop a little bit of a community around your business, maybe create a brand, but it still may not be enough because whatever efforts you have are insufficient against the tsunami coming the other way, which is that everything has gone online. And so you do see examples of that in private equity where deals do go wrong, of course, because no investment method is perfect. On the other hand, I think the default rates and the rates for things going wrong are generally pretty low. And when you look at the major firms, the ones that have been around for a long time and have expertise not just in leverage buyouts, but also in distressed, in credit, in other aspects of an operating business, for example, real estate may be involved. They could have an infrastructure aspect. Because they are knowledgeable with a kind of 360 degree view, they're more able to tackle challenges and pivot when is required. So even if you have a firm that is investing in a leverage buyout of a retail business, using the example I mentioned, if, for example, they have a great technology franchise, they will draw on that technology franchise to be able to assist that retail business in making that online transition. So I think, I think that it's rare, but the main lesson is it probably would have happened anyway, in my view. Now, what lessons can people learn in public markets? I think the truth is that in public markets, when you look at private investments going wrong, I, I don't think there's a direct read across of this is how you should run your public company differently. Um, but what I do think is that when they, when you look at the examples of deals that are unlisted, that have taken a long time, there's been a lot of effort. And I, as I said, I think they're quite rare and they've still gone wrong. You look at the effort that's gone into it to try to put it right. Those deals are often fought for, for five years, 10 years. And so, I think the read across and the lesson for public markets is look how much work they're putting into it, knowing that it may not work out. Look how much work, look how committed they are, look how invested they are, look how much skin in the game they have. And I think that is a little bit different from some public market situations where, you know, these folks don't really act just like employees in public market, in private markets. They're really acting as if they're engaged owners. And I don't think you see enough of that mentality all the time in public companies, right? And part of it is the incentive, part of it's the people. It's not about good or bad. It's just a different way of investing. It's a different mechanism. You wouldn't put all your money into public markets, I think, 
just like I don't think you should put all your money into private markets. But I think the read across is the effort, the motivation, and the fact that they are very engaged for a multi-year period, you know, just fighting for it till the end. And, you know, I've seen that with deals over the years, you know, there was no, there was no end to commitment. It just didn't work out. Yeah. And I'd, I'd say that as someone who's been an investor in public markets for, you know, for a long time, there's probably something to be learned from the patience that is applied to the private model. You know, a lot of times, you know, as you mentioned there, you figured that some of those businesses would have failed quicker. And uh, perhaps that's, you know, goes to the, the, the time horizon or the, the act of either renting versus owning a stock. Because the, those timeframes, as you know, investor timelines around how long they're willing to stick it out with a company has a, has a big impact, not only on the investment returns for them, but also on, you know, how public company management are able to run their business when they're, when they're held to, you know, quarter to quarter uh, numbers. I think that's right. And I think that we've seen this time and again, when people say public companies, it's tough to sort of look quarter to quarter and semi-year to semi-year and year to year and multi-year all at the same time, because you've got to satisfy all those constituencies who are staring at you that way in that lens in the, in the public eye. Um, but, but I think there is a read across. And I think, you know, often when I have looked at public companies or I'm partnering with private equity firms or investing in their funds to look at public companies, one of the, one of the criteria I look at when I'm meeting good management teams is to what extent do I think they will easily adapt to the private markets mindset because how are they running their companies today? You know, how engaged are they? How invested are they personally, financially, emotionally? You know, will they fight as hard as I see people fighting in the private markets? Those are some of the things that, you know, I look for. And I think that probably is one of the read across lessons when you look at public markets, when you look at the management of public companies, you know, how, how do they behave? Would those guys be able to cut it in the toughest private equity environments? And in many cases, they probably would, but it's a natural and fair question to ask. That's actually a good segue for my next question, because I want to talk about the people behind the deals that, you know, on the other side of the table here, because in your book, you mentioned seven characteristics that private inv equity investors need to either have or develop in order to be successful. And you, and you cite being organized, curious, driven, analytical, embracing of chaos, patient, as we talked about. And, and then one I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about, which is, and I'm quoting you here, having the emotional intelligence and empathy to realize that folks who are going to do the hardest work to create value during the life of an investment are on the shop floor, the management and employees of a business. So you must know how to identify and partner with them. So what does it mean to demonstrate emotional intelligence when you're restructuring a company and how do you do it well? So I think first you try to put yourself in their shoes. You know, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling when they meet us, the new guys, right? The investors have come on board. What are the judgments they may have already made based on what they know or don't know about private equity or the firm you work at or Wall Street in general? You know, there's a, there's a lot of that. And I think you just got to try and you got to try and do that up front because unless you can try and make that connection, and it's much more than just breaking the ice, it's really trying to say, how would I feel if I'm now working in this environment where the business that I work in or have founded even, it depends which role, of course, but how would I feel when there are new guys on the block, they've put a lot of capital in or they've lent to the business, they may have bought the business, they may have lent to the business, how am I feeling about working with them for a multi-year period? You know, I want to do it. I'm engaged. That's why I'm still here. That's why I've agreed to partner with them. What's it going to be like? And because for a lot of these folks, it's going to be the first time they've ever met private equity investors. And so it's natural to be curious. It's maybe even natural to be a little bit apprehensive as well as excited. And so I think that's the first step. I think the second step is to try to be as supportive and breaking down what they need to do to be successful. So you first identify what does success look like? To me, success looks like this. This is what good looks like. And that will lead to the right outcome for all of us on this investment. Second, how do we see the steps 
to get there and what's your part in that role so you're kind of working along with them to say you know do you agree with this roadmap and i think when you just do these two things empathizing and then just discussing planning it out you you get a lot of the way because you suddenly start to ensure as much as possible that everyone feels you're on the same team and then even more than that and i think what would count the most is you have to you have to stay engaged can't just do this for the first 6 12 months and then just not show up until it's time to sell right if you're going to think like a principal not an advisor you have to devote a portion of your career a portion of your time to portfolio management that doesn't just mean you know the board meetings every 2 months 1 month 3 months it doesn't just mean the dinners it doesn't just mean the phone calls it means the work in between it means okay how can i help you to make all of us more successful here's what i don't understand and it means being honest about things that you just you don't understand about the business even if you may have owned it already for a year or two right i mean how can everyone be an expert in everything when you're investing across multiple businesses and you may be dealing with these folks on the shop floor who have been doing that job for 30 years right and so you said wait i the one thing i never really understood is this help me understand that i feel really stupid but what about this and the more honest and open you are the more you'll realize that you're living that investment just like they're living that investment and that's how i found in the deals i've been involved with that have been the most satisfying everybody came together they really did they lived the investment for years and they they wanted to make it succeed they had to make it succeed and it was very clear what success looked like it was very clear what role everybody played um there were very few surprises and uh there was a real sense of collective multi-year effort we had olivier siboni on the show a few weeks ago i'm not sure if you caught it but he co-wrote a fascinating book about what he calls noise and decision making with uh, Danny Kahneman and Cass Sunstein. And one of his pieces of advice for reducing noise in the decision making process is to remove the human from the process where possible. Now, I mentioned this because I'm interested to hear how your family office, Achilles Management, uses AI to invest. It's a great question. Um, I think, first of all, as I've made clear, I think, in the book, that private equity private markets are a people business there's nothing automated about them there's no ai there's no supercomputer that can replace what the individuals do it's not market tracking it's active management by people and it relies on judgment on empathy on emotion on analytics it requires on uh, you know the best folks to invest and that's why i think if you can identify people with the traits that I've listed in the book and I've explained in the 13 14 chapters or so you'll see that's what I look for in the firms and the funds and the people in those funds when I'm putting money to work as an LP um and so I think I think it's very important to mention that up front now separate to that where I think um AI and let's just call it analytics uh machine learning you know the computer side the artificial side where that has been very helpful to me in my family office is more in liquid markets analyzing data analyzing trends um assisting the public markets analysis so it's really like we run two different strategies here however there is a read across to private markets and that read across is in a chapter in the book called the library where we talk about the power of data and intelligence that the major private equity firms are developing and it's unbelievable if you look at how they're investing in data science how they're investing in harnessing data of course they're extremely careful about the, how they manage this data there's no question about that but once you go beyond that fact that they're careful about confidentiality about all those things how are they using the data well it means that they can draw up heat maps of what's happening in the economy they can do ceo sentiments cfo sentiments surveys they can do litmus tests they have a barometer everywhere 
And it is pretty amazing. You could buy this company and then five years later, that company could be a supplier to another company that you're looking at as a private equity professional. And so you've already learned about another part of the business plan because you used to own a supplier or you used to own a customer or you looked at one, but it didn't work out for whatever reason, or you lent to one in terms of private credit or maybe as a distressed investment. And so where the read comes across is they're getting much, much better in how they use the data at their disposal. And it's not just the numbers, it's also the opinions, right? And I think that is increasingly seeing the sort of data science analytical aspect. And there's some firms which are amazing at this. I go on conferences and um, we have investor briefings and stuff at some of the firms like Blackstone. And it's, it's really unbelievable how much time, money, and effort they're investing in improving all these things. Um, and the idea, of course, is that'll help the management of the companies once they've invested. And that'll also help them identify new companies. And it'll probably help them position how they sell companies. Great. Well, let's, let's change gears for just a second here. I'd, I'd like to talk a bit about the markets. So uh, private equity and I guess private assets in general, for that matter, have benefited from long-term secular decline in interest rates, exacerbated in recent years, of course, by the significant st COVID stimulus. Now, with both inflation and rates on the rise, what do rising interest rates mean to the, to the growth of private equity? So here's where I think we need to look at the industry in a little bit more detail than as if it's a whole. So we don't look at, or we shouldn't look at, the media as if it's one creature, right? Uh, the same for any industry. And I think that we need to analyze a little bit. The sorts of firms that I spend the most time investing with, putting money in their funds and so on, those firms at the moment are I would say they're not as scared as you might think. And here's why I say that. Of course, they're going to be looking for areas of potential weakness with higher rates, inflation, you know, cost issues, supply issues, of course. But they haven't bought things priced to perfection. They haven't put themselves out there in the bull market, assuming that everything will remain extremely rosy and robust, and that's the only way they can make a profit, right? And so generally the firms that I'm putting money behind, they've invested in some form of dislocation or I call it chaos, or you could call it, you know, any edge. And that could be a slightly lower price, could have been a smart bargain. It could have been a thesis, which is not known to other people. It could have been a technology business that they discovered, you know, earlier than others, or they have a certain thesis about, they have an edge. And because they have an edge, the way they've won that investment is not just price. So they've probably paid less for it than either other people would be prepared to pay now or then relative to benchmarks. And when you pay a little bit less, by definition, you're putting probably a little bit less on an absolute basis, at least debt on it. So if you, if you pay 10 times EBITDA for everything and you leverage everything at six times and above, let's just use crude top level numbers. Well, in today's market, I mean, look at this week, it, it, multiples are much more likely to go down than, than, than go up. Now, of course, they could adjust as earnings adjust and all of those dynamics. But in the, in, in the first place, you know, what you think you can sell at 10 times in a great market, you may not be able to sell at 10 times in a worse valuation market. And so where I think you need to, where, where we need to sort of break things down is look at the firms that have invested in assets with this sort of edge. And so when inflation is higher, when interest rates are higher, yeah, they may have some things to think about. They may have to think carefully about, about um, the capital structure, about refinancing of bonds that are coming up in a few years' time. But actually, the, the thesis was not about, let me assume that I can sell this to somebody else at a high price. So... I think they're going to generally be okay and they may have to hold the assets for a little bit longer than they like because maybe it's not the right market to sell. But remember, they're unlisted and they have that luxury, so to speak, to be able to do that. Then on the other hand, 
you would have deals that only work in the most accommodative of financial conditions at the best valuations when they sell to somebody else. They're going to struggle. And they're going to struggle either because they underperform relative to the expectations of what was in those investment memos, or they're going to struggle because it's a combination of that with some business plan challenges. And hopefully all of those deals still end up working out. These are operating businesses. They employ people. They impact communities. You want them to work out, right? Most of the investors in these deals, whether they're the first kind or the second kind, they're going to be the retirees of tomorrow. You want those returns to work out. We all want those returns to work out. But they're possibly less likely to work out because they were made on more stretched assumptions in the first place. And that's where I think when people dig into understanding this industry a little bit better, they need to think about these kinds of questions when they're thinking of where they should allocate their assets going forward. Because going forward, I don't think that it's just going to be stocks and bonds. You may have 20% or more of your assets that potentially could be in these private markets. So how do you know which kind of deal you're going to be involved with? Are you going to be involved in the first kind of deal? Or are you going to be involved in the second kind of deal? Or some, some kind of deal that's in between? You need to know what you're identifying. And that's really one of the, the purposes of the book. So if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like valuations are compressed now. So existing deals in flight, we're probably going to see you know, a push out of the timeline on those in terms of uh, crystallizing those gains. But I imagine, I mean, with backs, uh, rates backing up to 250 on the short end, you know, cash is king in this kind of environment. So I wonder if, you know, less levered deals might be, the, the deal makers are a little bit licking their chops in this kind of an environment as well. Is there more opportunity for them to go shopping if they've got a lot of cash behind them? So I think to address the first thing you said, yeah, it's true that if you need more time to make your investment work out, when the market's more difficult, you will try to use that time because you're unlisted. I think that's correct. I think the other point you mentioned about putting more money to work, you know, obviously the less debt you use, the less of the leverage effect you have on returns, but the more capital you can put to work. And that's often one of the things I look at, which is, a lot of the deals that I've invested, a lot of the funds that I'm in, actually they use relatively less leverage than the numbers we talk about. Then They're often not using 60, 70%. They're often using 50% or less. And so you may say, well, hang on a minute. How can you get those returns out because you have less of that leverage effect on the equity? Well, maybe it's just a better deal. Maybe the business plan is such that they're backing a longer term secular trend or a great idea or a company that's coming out of transition. And the fact that you've used less debt and still made a great return just means that it was a better thesis in the first place. And so I think, you know, the tide is coming out a little bit, right, in this market. And you're going to see in the coming years as performance diverges in the industry, who's been doing what kind of deal. It's uh, Buffett's line. I mean, who's who's wearing their shorts? I guess isn't it when the uh, when the when the time when the tide goes out, you see who's wearing their shorts. I think something like that. Actually, that that prompts me to to ask a question that you you mentioned early on in our chat here about the mainstream nature of private equity and that it's 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 coming to a personal account near you. So if private assets are, are more likely to, to get into individual investors' accounts, what role do you think regulation should play in private equity? Because, of course, until now, we've had qualified investor rules and you know there's an expectation of sophistication on the part of investors to understand the risks that they're taking with it. So how, how, do, you bridge, how do regulators bridge the gap on the knowledge side for, for less sophisticated investors? That's a great question. It's a huge topic. And you can imagine there are lots of people working on that, both in the industry and at all the authorities, and the regulators, the supervisors, et cetera. I mean, it's obviously a very regulated industry, but we're talking about adjusting those regulations to new audiences, different audiences, and so on. And I think that what people will look for, I guess, is not just a thicker prospectus, because sometimes those can be a little impenetrable, right? When you get these enormous prospectuses, whether you're looking at it. I, I, I've written them before in my career early on. 
<laughs> sure. I mean, you can you can look at the stuff that's in the box up front, you know, the, the summary pages, but there's the other 500 pages behind that. And you're kind of wondering, well, you know, what does this really mean? I think it's probably more common sense understandings about, you know, let me just make sure we're super clear about what you're investing in. And I think they'll do a very good job. I think, uh, you know, I know so many firms I'm engaged with, they're super focused on it. Um, I don't think anyone is trying to rush. And I think that they're going to do, I would imagine they would do, my guess would be a pretty good job of the products coming out at a measured pace with the right regulations to make sure people understand what they're putting money into. And of course, there may be some changes along the way. But, you know, we have time. The, the most important point now, I think, is that it's coming. To a certain extent, it's arrived, depending on where you are in the pyramid. I think a lot of the mass affluent can invest through things like feeder funds now. You know, you don't need to have millions of dollars to put money into private equity firms and funds anymore. Uh, you can put, you know, s relatively smaller checks, although still big checks, in feeder funds. But it's, it's coming down. You know, the checks are coming down. Everything's coming down, I think. It's getting more accessible. And... At the moment, the most important point is awareness. And and I think as long as people have these kinds of questions in front of them, and, and I sort of summarize this in the book, I think in a few places, which is, if you were to ask yourself, am I being adequately compensated for the risks I'm taking? If you can't answer that because you don't know what compensation looks like or what it really means to you, and you don't really understand what the risks are, then obviously by definition, you're not ready. And so I think that's the kind of thing they're looking at. And you could see there are all kinds of things being discussed. They could have certain products that have a more a narrow risk return spectrum for retail investors. Um, you could have the same funds. I mean, there's lots of things they're talking about. So uh, I, th I, th I think both sides are all over it. But I think the most important point is you actually need to step back from what we have seen a little bit in this industry, which is something of an adversarial dynamic. You know, is private equity a good thing or a bad thing? A lot of people talk in those terms. You know, you've come on this show. Please tell me, are you for or are you against? You're a journalist. You're covering this industry. Are you for or are you against? I think that ship has sailed. I think we need to recognize that just like public markets, private markets are very important at funding tomorrow's retirees and today's retirees. And once we just kind of just accept that and realize there are better firms and worse firms, just like there are better public companies and worse public companies, there are better ETFs and worse ETFs and index funds and mutual funds, then we can start to get to the more important question, which is where should people be investing? What are the criteria they should be using to make these investment decisions? What are the factors they should be focusing on? And coming back to the book, because it's a people business, Unlike a lot of the public markets investing, unlike a lot of the automated trading, what is the psychology and the mindset that we should be looking for? And I think that applies to regulators too. I think engagement comes before change. I think engagement, appreciation, symbiosis, that comes before action. And I think there's still a little bit of ways of that to go when you see still some of the press or some of the commentary about, you know, this is happening, you should be scared, or this is happening, you shouldn't be scared. I think we just need to get away from that and start to just kind of move on to accepting it's an important industry. It's a huge industry. It's a massive growth industry for America. It's a place where America leads. It's an industry where America has led for decades. And we should accept and celebrate that and move on to sort of trying to make sure that the micro works once we've accepted that macro picture. Well, we're coming to, unfortunately, to the end of our time here, Sachin, but I, I do have one final question for you in two parts. What was your first job in the industry? And if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? That's a fantastic question. So my first job in the industry was at more or less a startup. Uh, I'd just done a number of years on Wall Street as an investment banker. I had some offers from established firms and I selected a firm because I had a bit of an entrepreneurial sort of drive or, you know, aspiration and worked at a place that 
was a very early developer, if not the, if not the developer of what we now call infrastructure investing. And I think the advice I would give myself is very much what I put front and center of this book, which is think like a principal, not an advisor. A lot of people coming into this industry are coming from the advisory business, an excellent investment bank, a good accounting firm, a good consulting firm, et cetera. Or, or they may have come from industry, but from industry, they may have been an employee as opposed to a business owner, right? And I think you've got to make sure you think as a principal. I thought I always did. Uh, that's why I wanted to do something different than advising. I wanted to be a principal, but of course I'd never been a principal. So you've got to, you know, see how it goes and see if it's really you. But I would just reinforce that message a hundred times. Think as a principal, not as an advisor. Because once you do that, once you eat what you cook, once you really have skin in the game, that's going to make all the difference for you. Many thanks for taking the time with us today, Sachin. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I've been speaking today with Sachin Kajuria, founder and CIO of Achilles Management, as well as author of Two and Twenty, a book out this month detailing his Wall Street insider's view of his experience as a partner of Apollo and other PE firms. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and this is me, Guiding Assets. <laughs>